Hello, hello. Welcome to the live stream after the Displace premiere. And hopefully everything is connected correctly. Looks like it is. We're going to give a little bit after the movie plays. People are automatically directed over into the live stream. And I hope that is smooth. And once people get in here, we're going to start bringing in our guests, all of them. I, I mean, I'm just really excited for this. I was excited to share the movie. How many of you watched the premiere and what did you think? And I am super excited. Let's see, there's 69 people now. We'll let it get to be a little more. As Oh, it's already up to 100, and I said I would go with the first guest at 100. So let me bring in Amber. Hey, how are you? Hey. Um, I'm is, good. Don't yeah? Go. You're... you're little bit frozen uh can you hear me uh, you can you? Frozen. Uh, oh you're you're, you're I okay you. i mean it's, okay um we haven't seen each other for two weeks and i i just want to say thank you for uh being in the new york times video um i don't know if cassie told you but uh it was your story that made all that happen. Um, and I'm just really grateful, grateful to spend time with you and uh, grateful that you uh, were able to share your story with us. I'm grateful for being able to share my story with you guys. Now, which park are you at? Because when we met two weeks ago, you had the notice to move, so by now you've moved a couple more times. Yes, I have. Um, first, I ended up in Tussing Park, and now I'm at Baker Park. The Baker Park was the one we didn't get a chance to go to. For those of you that are not aware, I just put into the chat a uh, link to a documentary that we did. Uh, that is featuring Amber and what's going on in Grant's Pass. So for those that don't know, give us a brief introduction to who you are and what's happening in Grant's Pass. Okay, um, I'm Amber. Um, I've been homeless on and off for the past 15 years. This stint has been about three i think um and yeah in grants pass it's a big fight with the, the police and the community and everything about being homeless they don't want us here and we're just fighting for our rights as humans you know to be able to belong somewhere like be able to live and survive and it's been pretty tough around but well, you know yeah, we're trying you, to make the best you, of it you, um, for the people that don't know, you lost your job in COVID, you're cleaning houses, and right. now you, like in the last year and a half, you've received 30 tickets at almost $300 a pop. Right. About that, yeah. I mean, and how? Like, uh, added up, it, 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 it adds up fast. And in, instead of punishing you guys, they should help you get out of the tent and into a decent shelter with dignity or preferably an apartment. Right. You would think that would be like the better scenario, but no, everybody just wants to get rid of us and not have to see us. So I'm hoping that this, this whole Supreme court thing is in our favor, hopefully, because <laughs> if not, we're kind of screwed, really. 
Yes, very much so. And for those of you in the chat who may not know about the Supreme Court thing, here is the um, New York Times video that Amber is in that really helped her story help shape it. And here's a link to the Johnson's v. Grant Pass website that has listings for protest um, in your area, demonstrations and protests. So we have a lot of guests here and I was honored. I wanted, I know it, you're outside and you're the one that's homeless and it's often logistically hard to be online. So I wanted you to come on first. Anything you'd like to say to people? Um, yeah, um, I just want to say that just because we're homeless doesn't mean we're not human. Like we still have feelings and emotions and the community being so tough on us, um, it can break us down, you know, and everybody out here is just trying to survive like everybody else, you know? So like try not to be so judgmental about the fact that people are homeless, like, cause literally you could get down on your luck and be one paycheck away from being in our shoes. Yeah. So. Oh my gosh. That's about, yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. And thank, thank you, Cassie, for helping to make this happen. We appreciate you. Hey, little cameo there yeah. by Cassie. Oh. Hold on. I got to turn off my phone, looks like. And thank you. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Wow. I'm, uh, I, I was excited about sharing the film with you guys. I was excited about all of our guests, but, um, I, uh, was looking forward to, uh, talking to Amber just to tell her uh, how grateful uh, I am and we are for uh, her inspiring uh, the New York Times story. Uh, it was uh, kind of one of those things that just happened. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping, as they say. So Addie is the chat moderator and Addie is currently homeless. Now, Addie is living in her car, like often has been the situation when we're doing live streams. Um, she is currently couch surfing, but it's still homeless. Addie is the best, I will argue, the best chat moderator. So treat her nice. She owns the room, can answer questions. Um, Addie is a brilliant chat moderator. And next, we're going to bring up Sean. Um, Sean, uh, I have to say uh, a little brief story first, um, is that I had met Sean when he was homeless on the streets of Koreatown, and he was going to do a, a story, a video for invisible people, but he wasn't feeling bad, and I never will push it. So uh, a couple days later, he did a story for CNN, which is better. I mean, they got a bigger footprint and it ended up snowballing in a good way that Sean is no longer homeless. And now uh, he's an independent homeless advocate that is um, really uh, giving his all to help get people into housing and Fight criminalization. Did I say all that right, Sean? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining us today. Of course. Glad to be here. Um, you want to tell us a little bit, a brief little bit about your story, and then we'll talk about criminalization. Sure. Um, uh, I mean, I, I had some pretty humble beginnings. Um, I was that nerdy child in school who actually liked homework and doing things of that sort. Graduated as valedictorian, graduated uh, from Yale University, worked on Wall Street, um, owned my own business for a while. Um, and then life got complicated. Uh, my, my business part, my business dissolved. Um, 
I, I ended up, uh, uh, you know, suddenly with uh, no income and wondering how I was going to move forward. And, uh, you know, life, life was very different. Uh, my husband and I ended up living in my Ford Explorer for probably a little over a year before we realized that we were homeless. Um, you know, it was quite a journey. There were many firsts, um, you know, uh, first time uh, going without a shower for months, first time witnessing someone getting killed, first time uh, not being able to have, not having anything to eat, first time being robbed at gunpoint, uh, first time spending seven days in the hospital with pneumonia, first time being stabbed in the back of the neck with a screwdriver. I could go on and on. There were many of these. And uh, fortunately, um, I was able to overcome and, and survive through, through these. Um, and that, uh, you know, uh, is something that not everyone has that fortune. Um, on any given day, five people die while living as being homeless. And, uh, you know, unfortunately I knew many of those people, yeah. um, you know, and my, that, that that's here in, in California, in California, in Los Angeles. Yes. Yeah. Across the country. I don't think there's a national number. I, right. There should right. be. It's to, the, it's, to, it's to the point that we we have to track those things. Uh, you know, um, during during the ten years that I was homeless, I kept count of eighteen people that I was close with who died or were killed during that time frame. Um, it, it really can have its toll upon you. Um, you know, the mental health challenges, um, just the safety challenges, your your medical challenges, um, all make it quite quite a, a difficult existence. You know. On, on each day, I've got to fight to find where can where am I allowed to use the restroom? You know, um, where can I find food and water? Um, where can I find somewhere to deal with hygiene, if all? Um, you know, I need to find a safe. I may have to find a safe place each and every day. You can't control who who decides to stay next to you, and they may be friend or foe. Um, you need to know about the gang uh, situation. I, I I knew nothing about that, so it's all new, new territory, you know? Um, and then if you have medical issues, like I have vision issues, um, it was really difficult for me at night, uh, you know, just seeing and, and keeping myself safe. So, um, you know, it's, it's something I don't wish on anyone. Yeah. Nobody should be homeless. Nobody should be homeless. Yeah. Grants pass. Yeah. You know, we just talked to Amber who's has to move from park to park. We uploaded, uh, uh, a documentary on it last night. Might have seen the New York Times feature. Um, criminalization is growing across the country. I know you have some firsthand experience. One of the parts of your story that I love and hate is that when your CNN story went live, it was the police yes. who came and told you. The police that you knew because... Because they had arrested me. I, I arrested that guy. I've arrested him two times right here. Um, yeah, they were the very first ones at 6.03 in the morning pulling their patrol car next to my tent and demanding that I come out so I could sign autographs because they just saw me on CNN and they arrested that guy several times. Right. right. The, um, the police that arrested you came woke yes, you up yes. to ask for autographs. Yes. I mean, yes. wow. Wrap your, yeah, wrap your head around that one. You can't um, make that stuff up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and there were many things um, about criminal, like, for example, when uh, we, we, we had that Explorer at the beginning um, and it was impounded by the city. And that's a whole nother story about, you know, we had handicapped placards. They kept writing the tickets regardless. It was my word against the, the meter maid's word. And of course, they looked at me and said, you're homeless. Who should we believe? Um, I even brought photographs showing the, the placard duct tape to the windshield. It didn't matter. Um, but anyway, at, um, when the vehicle was, was taken from us, um, I slept on the street for the very first time. And do you know on that very first time, I got a ticket the next morning for sleeping on a public sidewalk. This is prior to Los Angeles has an ordinance called 4118, which right. criminalizes sleeping, standing, uh, existing, or having... Uh, uh, one's belongings on public property that didn't that didn't exist yet. So um, this was just under uh, it was actually written up uh, by the Metro Police. Um, do you know that that ticket in 2016 turned into a nine hundred dollar ticket um, and we weren't able to resolve it 
And this is with the help of two Yale lawyers and, and a judge in 2021, December 2021, um, we were able to. And, and we, we then learned that it was actually the ticket was written under the traffic department because that they didn't know where to put it at the time. Yeah. Um, and that's what, what made it so difficult. Um, but what, what what people don't know, because I believe this is my belief is that as homelessness is growing visibly, the people are scared and frustrated. COVID had a part to do with that. We got two wars going on, gas price, you know, I mean, people are just scared and they want homeless people gone. Yeah. And so they're supporting this criminalization, which just pushes homeless people to another area and to another area. And homelessness is growing at yeah. the same time. So it is literally insane to well, continue this criminalization. And, and there, there are a lot of negative effects that people don't think about. Um, having to continually move um, depletes your, your scarce resources and makes it difficult for you to get ahead. Um, you know, since everything, every time you move, you lose a bunch of stuff. Um, and, and you have to reestablish, uh, you know, support services like where to use the restroom at 3.30 in the morning when you got to go and, and, and other important things. Um, but I think one of the things that people often don't realize is it creates a control element um, because uh, they know that we're probably not going to be able to make those court dates that, that often arise when we don't pay the citations with the money we don't have. Yeah. Um, and then that creates warrants which then makes it such that whenever the police come and want us to move, all they have to do is say, we're going to check your, run your ID and everyone complies. It creates this, this control and compliance because I don't want to spend three days in jail. They're going to release me, but it, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. I'm going to lose everything I have during those three days because either the city's going to take it or other people are going to take it, assuming it's, it's been abandoned. Um, right. But then even more so once you become, once you are trying to get out of the street, um, it creates other barriers to the housing process. Um, when landlords and, and, and building management uh, check your, your background, um, it, it, these come up as, as warrants, as, as things on a criminal record, and they can uh, prevent you from being able to get housed, even though you have a Section 8 voucher or you have employment. Um, these things then stay with you. And unless you're able to get legal help right. to remove these from your record, um, the very thing they're trying to do is just get you off the street is now impeded by the, by them criminalizing it. And now there's no way to get you off the street because no one will let you, no one will rent to you. Yeah. I, for example, here, for those that you don't know, you know, uh, in Tennessee, it's a felony to be homeless now. So you lose your job, you're living in a tent cause you don't have any other choice cause you can't rent. And then you get a felony on your record and then it's like nearly impossible to get a job, which means you're going to be homeless longer and probably get another felony. And I mean, it's it's ridiculous to think we're going to rest our way out of homelessness. Yeah. So, Sean, in our four minutes we got left, what's the solution? Because I know you're working with Barb Poppy and a lot of, a lot of other people you're working with, uh, Lassa here in Los Angeles. What what can the public support? What do you see as the solution? Well, unfortunately, we're all focused on on the symptoms and and uh, I guess the busy work of, of trying to house people. The problem is there's no affordable housing. That's where we need to start. Um, you know, many cities and states like in California, Los Angeles, uh, stopped making affordable housing in the 70s and 80s. And so our stock of available affordable housing has been depleted for, for decades. Um, and until we catch up with that, there's nowhere to put people. So what often happens is you, you take people into shelter, you run them through housing navigation, you get them matched up with a, a program that will, will help them cover the rent and, and get, their, uh, get a foothold, but there's no apartment to rent. You know, so they're all like, they're all like bridges to nowhere. So right. until we build housing, all we're doing is playing a shell game and moving people around and around in circles. And the other issue is that there's more people entering into homelessness. Yes. I For every $100 increase in median rent, homelessness increases 9%. 
I know uh, I was just in the Bay Area and they said for every person they get off the street, three new people enter into homelessness. Yeah. And yeah. the public sees all this money being spent. And I'm, I, nonprofits, there's some bureaucracy and waste. I'm not saying things don't need to tighten up and systems don't need to improve. They do. But the reason is homelessness is growing. Nonprofits are right. housing more people than ever before, but they just can't keep up. Yes, especially with, with the rising rents and rising regulations and, and the wages aren't keeping up with the rising rents. Um, and as you mentioned, in, in Los Angeles, on, it, you know, on average, every day, 205 people in la last year were housed. Unfortunately, 221 on every day fell into homelessness. It's a dynamic process. It's not just the same people. It's a process that's happening. We have we have a a stock of people who are homeless at this moment, and then we have a faucet on, like filling the tub, and it's overflowing. Yeah, and we're turning the faucet off. Um, you were just featured in a Harvard magazine, correct? Correct. Yes. Oh my gosh! I will send a link. I'll tweet it out later. Uh, Sean sent it to me. Uh, I want to make sure that people can connect with you and learn more about your story. And I have a video with you. I'm still waiting to get up. We've been just the grant pass just pushed all of uh, our our production aside. Yeah. Well. Well, Mark, I I I I offer my help because I really appreciate the work that you're doing in this area of, of using media to uh, bring light to all that's going on and to, and to show people's lives as they really are and, and try to make that human connection if we can. Um, you know, it, it makes a difference. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for spending some time with us. You're welcome. Wow. Wow. First we had Amber from Grants Pass in front of her tent and then Sean talking about both the criminalization and how we need to fix the affordable housing crisis. And now I'm going to bring on Sarah. So Sarah, is this the first time we've done this? A live stream, yes. Yeah, but we like we haven't been in a panel or anything, right? We haven't had an interaction. Is that right. I feel like I feel like we've been connected for so long. Oh my gosh, for like forever. And I know invisible people we've had one of our journalists interview you i think it was cynthia um and uh we've shared each other's content on social media i have huge respect for you uh i consider you one of the leading experts in criminalization so tell us a little bit about yourself oh my gosh well first i have to say uh, you know what an honor it is to be here with you um, because uh, I, I'm definitely fangirling um, over uh, over all the work that you do and Invisible People does. It's amazing to hear from Amber and Sean uh, and so many others who, who really have such um, incredible expertise uh, and insight. So uh, uh, me, I am a professor of law at Seattle University School of Law, uh, where I also um, direct the Homeless Rights Advocacy Project, which is an effort to engage law students in um, research analysis and, ad analysis and advocacy around homeless rights issues. Um, bring us up to date briefly, because this criminalization goes back for a long time, right? Um, yes. And it, it's like hitting a pinnacle point. And so can you Give us a little history and then bring us into Grant's pass in the Supreme Court case. Sure. I mean, the history goes all the way back before the founding of this country. I, I don't think you meant to ask um, for the history going all the all that way back. But, um, you know, when this country was founded, um, we brought over vagrancy laws um, from England, um, turned them into uh what are called warning out laws uh, that were basically designed to um, keep unemployed people from entering different territories. So really trying to push out poor people. 
Uh, then, of course, you've got slavery, um, which is uh, 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 another way of, of, of dehumanizing and, um, and controlling the presence of and, and oppressing um, groups of people, especially black and brown folks. Um, but even after slavery was uh, made illegal, um, a number of areas, especially in the South, uh, started, um, had enacted black codes. And under black codes, um, uh, African Americans uh, were, um, were essentially warned out and kept out of public spaces. Uh, once those codes were removed, then you've got sundown town laws and Jim Crow laws. Uh, and Antioche laws. And so there, there's all throughout history, we have shown our instinct is to use the law to keep undesirable people from accessing public space. So, um, you know, that's, that's that go, the history that goes all the way back is now manifested itself in the in criminalization laws, which refers to laws that prohibit or severely restrict um, the ability of unhoused folks to engage in necessary life-sustaining activities in public. Um, and so the Johnson case, um, you, you may have been asking me specifically about the history of the Johnson case, um, but the Johnson case is a, a, a case that's pending in front of the U.S. Supreme Court it was appealed um, from a decision at the Ninth Circuit level. Uh, and the issue in the Johnson case, really at its core, is whether cities should be allowed to punish homeless people for surviving in public space, even if they don't have a safe and legal place to go. And I think punish is the word to use because it is. You're being punished because you can't afford rent. Right. And there's some really silly distinctions. You know, if you take common sense and give it to lawyers, they'll, they'll figure out a way to make it stupid. Um, but there's some really dumb distinctions that the law tries to draw between criminal punishments, um, you know, which is like, does, do cities have the right to charge someone criminally for being homeless? Um, and then there's civil um, punishments, which are like tickets um, or fines and fees or where they impound your car, something that uses the civil legal system to punish you um, for not having a safe and legal place to exist. Some of it, and I, I, I uh, got this phrase from Pete White. I like to give attribution and I, I lift phrases from Pete all the time. Uh, Pete is the uh, CEO of LA Can for people that don't know. I know Sarah knows. Um, but Pete said that it's psychological warfare. And the reason there's these ticketing like Amber talked about and Sean talked about, the reason that there's these ticketing is to just wear homeless people down so they'll move, but there's no place to move to. I mean, there is, they can go to the other city and that city is criminalizing and doing the psychological warfare. It makes zero sense. It, it really does. And, and for those who might be doubting that that's the purpose of these laws, um, fortunately or unfortunately uh, for grants pass, um, that one of the city council members or, or local politicians actually went on the record and said, look, the whole point of this law is to get people out of here. We want them to leave. Uh, and so you're hundred percent right. The, the intention of these laws is, is to punish people. Um, and, and uh, for, for folks, you know, you, you can hear from Amber and from Sean and countless others. Um, there, there are few things um, that are more central to someone's feeling of being human than to feel like they can belong or be included in community. And so exiling people um, for circumstances they can't control, for their poverty, for their disability, for their race, all of the other things that we know are disproportionately um, reasons why uh, uh, people fall into homelessness and why folk, folks are disproportionately already marginalized groups are disproportionately represented in homeless populations um, is because um, 
there is a, a historical, very deeply rooted desire to purge folk, those sorts of folks from undesirable folks from public space. And that is deeply traumatizing, um, deeply inhumane, um, and, and should be illegal. Yeah. yeah, that's what should be illegal. That's where the law should step in. So what happens? What happens in June? Because the 22nd is when the Supreme Court starts hearing the case. What happens? I mean, either give us a either case scenario. Well, um, yeah, I'm not a gambling woman, but um, I would really hate to gamble on this case, um, especially with this Supreme Court. This Supreme Court, the Constitution of this Supreme Court, has shown itself to be hostile to civil rights and human rights, uh, and. So I've got my fingers tightly crossed. If you look at it from a moral and legal standpoint with a clear eyes, that it should be, um, the Ninth Circuit decision should be affirmed. And if SCOTUS does that, if the Supreme Court affirms the Ninth, Cir the Ninth Circuit's decision, then um, all that really means <laughs> is, is that cities will no longer be able to, um, to, to, to excessively fine um, or, or, or issue tickets and excessively fine uh, people who are unsheltered when there is no safe or legal place for them to be, when there's insufficient shelter. Um, and by taking that really, really wasteful, inhumane, um, punitive uh, uh, action away from cities, um, what that would do is really force them to focus on solutions to homelessness, non-punitive, evidence-based um, solutions to homelessness, um, many of which you've talked about, Amber has talked about, Sean has talked about. It doesn't take a, a you know, but a Google search for cities to find yeah, yeah. loads of ways that they yeah. can address homelessness. We have a Helsinki documentary. We're off to another city to show that it can be done here. But I, I, something you said that, you know, cities would be forced to find solutions. Wow. First off, they shouldn't be forced to find solutions. They should want to find solutions. They right? should want to, but you know what? Uh, can I just give my little like? Um, Go for it. Yeah, I, I, I feel like the problem is that um, home uh, policies around homelessness are left to politicians, and politicians don't have an incentive to focus on long-term solutions because those are things that their successors would get credit for. They have an incentive to try to make the problem as invisible as possible. And that's why they engage well, in, in this, office. really perpetrate this fraud of smoke and mirrors moving people around, yeah. which we know makes homelessness worse, causes wow. enormous harm to unsheltered people um, and wastes a ton of money. Yeah. Um, and they get away with that fraud because, um, because people because they're so successful in the smoke and mirrors. Right. Right. So I, I hope that I hope that the Supreme Court will uphold it. If they don't, um, if they rule in favor of grants pass and against the hundreds of thousands of people across the country that sleep on the streets of cities throughout the United States, uh, it'll mean, um, it, you know, really a, a open season in terms of criminal criminalizing um, people who are unsheltered. Uh, I think that outcome would be terribly inhumane. Um, it, it's terribly wasteful. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't, it, as you mentioned many times, it makes no sense to fine and jail people um, for for yeah. homelessness. Um, so I really hope that people will pay attention to this case yeah. um, and understand how important it is. Um, the, the other thing I should say is I don't want everybody to freak out um, if the Supreme Court doesn't uphold the case if they find in favor of grants pass. Um, I have the belief that there's a number of states. Um, states have their own constitutions and states can make decisions yeah. that are more protective of rights yeah. than the federal government says. So states can yeah. do that. And um, our community organizers, our young people um, are, are 
I, I just believe in their ability to fight for what's right. Well, that is what probably is going to happen. Like when we were filming the movie and we had a Columbia police officer on the set and we we're talking about it. And he said, you know, we're not going to arrest people. <laughs> we're just not going to do it. Right. Um, at least that's for now. Really brief little time we have left. What can people do? And I'm going to put a link in to demonstrations and protests that are happening next week. The big one is Monday, the 22nd in Washington, D.C. If you can go, here's the link. Um, you could host one in your own city. I know uh, there's a woman that's homeless in Austin, Texas. She's organizing one at the courthouse. So where I want to go is real brief. What can people do? Yeah, I, I, I think you you underlined it. You know, there's a lot of actions that are taking place on the 22nd, which is the date that the oral arguments will be heard. Um, and something else folks can do is um, is. is try to um, get as educated as possible uh, about what those legal issues are. Um, the National Law Center, the National Homelessness Law Center um, is, is trying to do more to activate attorneys to help support uh, community organizers. A lot of that has been um, the work of the Western Regional Advocacy uh, um, Project that is out of San Francisco. They're um, a, a, an organization that does a lot of organizing of different community organizations. So there, people can um, can turn to community organizations within their areas to really make this a big advocacy issue. And from where I sit as lawyers, we we are duty bound um, to, to listen, learn, and help. Yeah. Educate yourself, get active local, and uh, also pay attention to what's happening national and help when you can. That's right. Thank you so much, Mark, for well, all you thank do. Thank you so much for joining me today. It was an honor. We have to do this again. I totally agree. Bye. Bye. Wow. This is uh, uh, one of the best live streams that I've ever been a part of, much less produced. Um, hopefully you guys are all encouraged and ready to fight criminalization. Uh, our next guest is... Uh, Spencer, um, I'll let you, I'll let him introduce himself and, oh, I got to get, I'm not good at this. Um, and we're going to shift the conversation a little bit. Um, although if Spencer wants to talk about criminalization, that's great. Um, the movie featured a veteran, Ray, who was, you know, served in an Afghanistan and then he was out on the streets. And veterans homelessness, I know we've gotten much better at helping veterans, but there's still a long way to go. So Spencer, nice to meet you. Thanks for spending some time with us. Thank you for having me, uh, Mark. It's uh, a, a great opportunity. Um, my name is Spencer Bell. I'm the policy analyst for the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans. Um, and and the, the movie that was screened was exceptionally poignant and it, it provided a lens that showed the dire impacts that the criminalization of homelessness and homeless veterans included is having. I can't thank you enough. Yeah. Well, no, I, that, it was Luciana. You got to thank Luciana. She was adamant that the main character had to be a veteran. I tried to talk her out of it if you want to know the truth, but she, she is, uh, uh, very, um, uh, when she has something that she feels passionate about, she fights for it. And this is one of those times that she was extremely right. So talk, bring us in about what's happening with veterans homelessness. I know, so this is just my lens. I know when Obama came in, he mandated that we solve veterans homelessness. There was a big shift. There was some significant impact but there's still a long way to go. I've been so busy with everything else. I, I haven't um, stayed into uh, what's going on with veterans homelessness. Sure. Let me uh, f fill in the uh, interim. Um, it, it is still a long ways to go. Uh, the National Coalition is the only national organization focused solely on ending veteran homelessness um, and making veteran homelessness brief, 
non-recurring and rare. Um, but on any given night, there's over 35,000 homeless veterans alone um, uh, in this country. Um, and as a subset of the American population, um, you know, these struggles of everyday Americans are familiar, but amplified in unique ways, just in disproportionate ways uh, for veterans, such as level of disability, mental health, uh, and impacts of advanced aging. Um, and, and you're right, there have been uh, strides made during uh, the pandemic. The federal government created programs to assist homeless veterans. And across the country, um, uh, veterans, uh, institutions and um, organizations were allowed to keep veterans safe, decompress shelter spaces, ramp up aid and rapid rehousing capacity, uh, focus uh, you know, on individualized housing uh, options in, ho in hotels and motels. And these were bipartisan policies. You know, these these were things that, uh, you know, resulted in an over 11 percent decrease in homeless and homelessness amongst veterans in just one year during the pandemic when, when they were instituted. Wow. Um, but as of this past year, this past May, uh, our leaders arbitrarily decided to remove all of the um, uh, emergency protections underneath the public health emergency and just not paying attention to the fact that the homeless emergency was still there. Right. And to put a fine point on it, the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, recently released their most recent point in time count, um, where they saw a, a increase of 7.4% in, in the homeless veteran population and 12% in the general population. Right, right. But like, my job as an analyst is to look deeper. And so I, I, I dug deeper into those numbers and it was there was a much starker reality that's not even being reported. You have the issue that there was actually a 14% increase in unsheltered homelessness among veterans. And wow. they what they do is they average that because as, as uh, my predecessor was just talking about, they, they want to glaze over the, the most inconvenient facts as much as possible and, and make sure that these things are not visible. Um, you, you, we like that was even with the, with individuals who were sheltered. There was a three percent increase um, in homelessness for those who could find shelter. Right. So I mean, and that's not even talking about the disabled veterans who uh, often are unable to meet work requirements due to you know high barrier shelters um, uh, requirements and or uh, obtain sufficient employment to pay what their vouchers do not if they are able to uh, get a voucher. So, some veterans, uh, um, uh, vouchers actually make them ineligible. Uh, uh, their, their, sorry, their disability makes them ineligible for vouchers. Really? And these are, really. Wow. The, these are things, specifically, uh, even in California, where you have, issue, you have these specific large um, campuses that are being built specifically for these high acuity veterans, these, these individuals who have... Uh, you know, extensive health issues that that need the wraparound and supportive services yeah. are themselves precluded from using these services because they were injured in the line of duty. My firsthand experience was um, I have a video, one of my first housing first videos uh, of a homeless veteran. It does a before and after of a gentleman named Lanny. Um, and he you know, I, it wasn't just me, you know, this organization, I want to be clear about that, but I committed to getting Lanny help, something about him. And uh, it took four and a half years. And when the VA was ready, I couldn't find Lanny, right? He was really good. He, I, I don't know how much you know about California, but he lived for six months in the Glendale Galleria, which I think should get an award of some kind, right? Because he's so good at hiding that he went unnoticed in the mall for six months anyways and then when lanny was ready there was layers of bureaucracy that we just couldn't get through and so the whole process took four and a half years and it, it was just maddening to me so i was hoping some of that had been fixed and i'm sure some of it has right but that is one of the big issues uh, a friend uh, of mine says bureaucracy kills, and she's so very right. Tell me, what has changed 
because the world has changed, we have different wars. You often think of the Vietnam veteran, um, you know, the homeless Vietnam. What has changed, if anything, of the face of veterans' homelessness? Veterans are becoming homeless much sooner. They are they are recognizing the fact that um, couch surfing, um, living in your vehicle, um, and not having access to uh, any type of shelter is putting themselves in a position where they they are actually being um, they are actually accessing um, uh, services from VA. The the um, the VA services have uh, less of a stigma attached to them. They they are they are outreaching faster. They are able to uh, access individuals uh, by providing uh, by providing them cell phones, access, communication, and and transportation to and from appointments. Or at least they were able to during the pandemic. Um, th those uh, items were stripped away this past May, and we went back to square one. Um, I didn't stripped away. Oh my gosh! We we had we had a a a, a, a moment in time where uh, the VA was able to use a, a gracious amount of uh, money that was provided by Congress to be able to provide for the for a decent amount of need of the homeless veterans, and that has been allowed to sunset authorizations that VA had to be able to provide these types of services went away, um, and we are we are working you know fighting tooth and nail every day to try to uh, reinstitute re these uh, authorizations to expand program eligibility uh, for homeless veterans uh, for, for these programs that are already in the books, uh, increase funding for those programs, actively work to create new programs on the federal, state, and local levels. Wow. Um, it, it, because these programs, like you said, the bureaucracy kills. Yeah. The, the layering of these different programs, uh, the funding, between them are actually actively made incongruent with each other. So they, they won't work with each other. Yeah. And, and that's one more way that they conserve how much money is going out from federal coffers into state and local coffers to be able to provide services for veterans. They just make it as onerous as possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, we only have a couple moments left. Um, well, Tell me something good. Tell me something positive that's happening, and then tell tell us how we can help make that positive more positive. Right. What What's positive is that we are seeing the actual acknowledgement that this criminalization of poverty is not the way to go. It, it has found its way into state and local legislatures. Uh, because there has been such pushback against this criminalization of homelessness, this criminalization of homeless veterans, um, this inability to actually see the problem for what it is. But now that we see this, we see states that are going around that, th those issues, uh, states such as uh, what, what have we, we've already discussed, Tennessee, Missouri, Kentucky, Nevada, Georgia, and most recently Florida that are doing these criminalization pushes, they are doing this in advance of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court decision that will be heard on Monday and be decided in uh, June. Um, but we have such great uptake. Uh, NCHV was filed an amicus brief for the, the Supreme Court case, uh, along with 45 other partner organizations to uh, on behalf of homeless veterans saying that this Th th this is not okay. It was picked up by Congress. The the issue the issue was being moved forward, but it's really something that we had to let sink in. That it, with all these people who represent us, that even those who served our country, you know, upon separation from active duty, are being branded as criminals through no fault of their own, right, right. Uh, but through by lack of a permanent address. That's what we're trying to do in the movie is to give people an emotional connection. I mean, the dominant narrative, uh, and Luciana's coming up next, so that's what we're going to be talking about. The dominant narrative was really criminalization to give the public an emotional connection. But we also wanted to show, you know, here's a veteran and how 
that one demographic it affects them all, how criminalization keeps somebody out on the street. On the on the on the on the streets. God, I sound like a robot there. On the on the on the. Um, anyways, we've got to run. Uh, give your website so that people can look up and learn how to support. Uh, our website is uh, nchv.org, um, and I would really uh, push people to donate in the corner of the screen right here. That is also how you can help. Oh wow, wow. Oh, thank you very much. But now I got to do a disclaimer. <laughs> Thank you. You're awesome. Um, wow. What a great show. Thank you, everybody that's watching. And thank you, everybody uh, that uh, is participating. I I, I, I have to uh, uh, give a little uh, explanation. And I, I normally do it earlier about why there's a donation link here. Is it Facebook does this thing called Super Chat. And I can't stop people from doing super chats. I'm honored. It's a way to donate to your favorite creator, but YouTube takes 30%, right? So if you give a dollar, 70% goes to that creator and YouTube keeps 30%. But if you set up a, 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 a donation nonprofit, 100% goes to the nonprofit. So there are times when we will do fundraising streams. This isn't one of them. We don't ask for money. I'm grateful that Spencer gave the plug. And if you want to donate, we're a good cause. Uh, we need the money. Uh, I often tell people, donate locally. Um, connect to a local nonprofit. But I just want to make it clear, we're not fundraising here. The reason that fundraising link is there is just because so many people often give to Super Chat. And, you know, I love YouTube, but YouTube has enough money, right? 30% they take. So um, anyways, I you may not know this. We're also simultaneously streaming to Twitter and Facebook. And I got to look, hang on. It's kind of blown away. We haven't done this in a while. Um, there's 240 people watching on Twitter. 240 people watching on Twitter. I didn't think that was going to be a thing. We have 152 here. Facebook only has three people. Come on, Facebook, wake up. Um, but wow, 240 people are watching on Twitter. Hi, Twitter. The thing about Twitter and even Facebook, um, we'll, we'll have to get, uh, Addie, we'll have to clone Addie so she can be over on Facebook. And cause if you're just tuning in, Addie is a homeless friend of mine. She's not in her car, but she's still couch surfing. Um, and she is our chat room moderator, but uh, it'd be hard for her to do all of them at once. And Twitter, I don't think you can engage. But anyways, um, I want to bring in, I did that again. Why am I doing that? And here's Luciana. Ta-da! Hi, everybody. Hey, we did it. We did it. We did it. This one was a challenge. I mean, they're all challenges. This one is very special, though, not only because of the issues we are facing. I think just by reading the chat, it seems like a global problem. In America specifically, the criminalization issue is something to really bring to light. Um, I hope this scripted film will allow people to engage with the subject in a way that doesn't seem threatening. Um, for those of you, I should probably clarify my statement. So, uh, you probably have to be under a rock if you didn't know there was a writer strike and a actor strike last year, which influenced all probably media across the world even, right? But it significantly influenced Los Angeles and you personally, um, cause there was no work, right? 
Um, so right. that was our biggest challenge. Right? We we were hoping to have this done earlier in the year, but you couldn't work because everybody was on strike. Yeah, but we got it done. And I think, you know, the challenges that we face end up being the secret sauce, the special gifts that come along the way. And I think this is what happened here. We in, intended to shoot in St. Louis originally, and that became increasingly difficult. And we found a home in Columbia, Missouri. Everybody there is just phenomenal. I always say that I'm in love with Missouri now. Like I want to come back. Columbia has a very special group of people who jumped on board of this experience in you know, one of my favorite things was talking to the cast and talking to the local homeless people throughout, you know, the two weeks, the, the whole week that we shot and a little bit more than we were there. Yeah. It was nice to have this conversation with them because the crew was just coming to us and saying, whoa, I didn't know this. Like, I, I am now having conversations with homeless people on the street. And before I was scared or I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to engage. Right. That alone was an educational piece that I would hope everybody would get from working with us. And on the flip side, you know, we had the local homeless, you know, community is saying, whoa, this is so cool. Like, you guys came here to talk to us. And, you know, I can't wait to see what this looks like. And, and feeling seen and represented is really important. Yeah. And we tried to hire people. So uh, you would see homeless people because we made a homeless encampment in a parking lot. And there would be homeless people walking by and looking on, and we would try to hire them. We wanted to hire them, but for whatever reason, and it's their personal thing. Not everybody wants to be on camera. And, uh, you know, uh, but uh, can you walk us through what this story means to you? Yeah, I think, you know, I loved hearing the guests we had here today about the criminalization issue. I live in Los Angeles right now and there is no street that you drive by, walk by, that you don't see people that are homeless. And it, it's a concern. It makes me think of when this criminalization issue, if it passes, there are government programs that people will qualify for. Like someone else said in this live chat, you, you know, they're going to do a background check when you try to rent an apartment. They're going to do a background check when you try to get a job. Like you are sentencing people to forever be in the criminal system. And when I think of that, it makes me think of, well, it makes sense because America has a for-profit privatized, you know, incarceration system. So when you start to look at, you know, the actual politics behind it, it's scary. And I don't want to live in a place where, you know, we are incarcerating people for profit. Yeah. Um, as other people mentioned here, the money that is spent on these sweeps could be used for housing. And my question is like, why are we not doing that? Yeah. So um, I'm just blown away that there's 250 people watching on Twitter uh, that just, uh, I decided to flip the switch and have us go everywhere. Um, hello, Twitter. Hello, Facebook, um, YouTube, YouTube family, you know, you're my favorite, but um This is such a good movie. I mean, uh, every movie, those of you that don't know, we have done several. Uh, Homeless um, was your first. I wasn't really involved with that. And then Mobile and then Eviction and now Displaced. And each one has gone up. I mean, if people actually knew how low budget we are, <laughs> it's yeah. really impressive. Um, talk to us. How do you make this happen? Because I know how little budget we have, and that's a huge miracle. One word, community. That's it. People care. Um, you know, also reading on the chat, I said, who cares about this? No one cares. People care. People showed up. Community showed up. In Missouri, we had somebody we met at Walmart who was like, I'll volunteer. He showed up for, you know, our homeless encampment scenes. People want to participate and people want to help make a change. I think our job is to educate and inform how can that be possible from a micro scale to a macro scale. Um, and that's why we do this every day, right? One of the things I tell people all the time is what I learned from Mark, which is like, talk to a homeless person, make eye contact, you know, treat them like people. <laughs> like, that's the one, such a small thing. And we think of mental health, it's just a huge conversation these days. I was walking in Santa Monica and some guy for, working for Greenpeace or whatever it was, people would just pass by him and he, pretend he wasn't there. And then I looked at him and I said, you know, they have a good day. And he goes, oh my God, thank you so much for saying hi. And that was one day, you know, one day. 
And can you imagine being homeless and going through that every day over and over and over again? It really is what Mark calls becoming invisible, right? This is why we're here, invisible people. You start to disappear and you start to question yourself on, on some very ground-based levels, which is, you know, I think becomes a little bit more scary of where, where are we going to go as people? Um, I was just about to ask people if they wanted to ask questions and Sarah uh asked how do you decide whether to do a documentary or a scripted movie what are the pros and cons of each and i will give you my quick answer to that because it was luciana who taught me because i never 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 in my wildest dreams wanted to do a scripted movie I'm, you know, uh, one of these documentarians that believe we shouldn't interfere, but we should just capture reality um, and, and do the best we can to tell their stories. Um, but Luciana, first, because we have a million subscribers on YouTube, I get a lot of film companies, production producers, that approach me. Some are pretty big budget. Some have even some named celebrities, but it was always missing something, right? It was missing the reality of homelessness. So Luciana's first film, uh, Homeless, has a scene in it where the homeless man is eating, uh, he's outside a restaurant and there's a woman eating a pizza inside. And there's no dialogue. And, but you could feel, you know, the homeless man was hungry, envious, jealous, looking at the woman eating the pizza. And she saw the homeless man and went, oh my, I've got to put it down. She said, and I went, wow, that is so reality. That I couldn't tell in a documentary. And there's another scene in that where he's got to go for a job interview and he's trying to figure out where to put his backpack. These are real challenges homeless people face. And Luciana understood that and she wrote it in. So when you're doing a documentary and the quick answer is it's different stories for different audiences. What I think the advantage to scripted films and it's why we continued is there are scenes that will tell the story of homelessness in a way, I mean, they still have to be authentic, that you can't do in a documentary. Now, the documentary tugs on different emotions where a scripted film, and all of our scripted films are based on true stories. So it's not like it's, just fantasy. They're based on true stories. So what is your answer, Luciana? And thank you, Sarah. That's a brilliant question. I think you answered it really well. For me, you know, watching the content Mark was creating at Invisible People, first person documentary interviews, I think they were very powerful. But I kept hearing from people over and over again, I don't want to come home and watch, you know, a two hour documentary about homelessness after work. I'm tired. I want to be entertained. I want to be distracted. So I thought, okay, well, maybe we'll create a film that is still educational, that it still shows the reality, but that is a little bit more digestible, you know, that it will bring this element of enter entertainment that people will not feel so um, heavy by at the end. And I love some people in the chat saying they cried. I mean, I cried. I mean, there's scenes that we shot walking through the homeless encampment every single crew member was crying i was crying everybody was crying like it was such a powerful feeling of seeing what it looks like walking through an encampment as if you were there that was so powerful um and that's the things that the normal person don't get to experience yeah. you know a normal person who is afraid of homelessness and who doesn't want to engage with the subject will not walk on encampment but we made this movie in a way that they, they feel what it feels like to be in there, in the mix. And that was the purpose. Yeah. Um, you brought up a good point that I, I should have um, uh, also said is what we try to do. And a good example is this week, 
we were part of a New York Times video. If you haven't seen it, it's really powerful. I put it in the chat earlier. And that actually reached a lot of people outside of the social services sector. Mm -hmm. uh, the documentary that we published last night that I've also placed in the chat um, is more so those of us in the sector, right? To rally the troops, get us all on the same message. They both have value. So the one thing we've tried to do with the limited, but can I tell them how much we you did? No, before? it's a mystery. No, not this one, mobile. Oh, sure. You okay. can tell them how much, yeah. $5,000, full film, everything. Shooting, cinematography, editing, music, sound, $5,000. I'm not going to tell you what this one is, but um, even evicted. I mean, uh, that's a testament to you, Luciana. Um, but my point is for our limited budget, and it's very limited, what we're trying to do is create videos, create movies that will hopefully reach people who would not normally watch a video on homelessness. It's also presented here on YouTube where a lot of people, you know, homelessness is a hard topic. I think people walk by and they want to ask a homeless person uh, what's up, but they're intimidated or scared or whatever. And in, you know, on their laptop, on their phone, you know, it's really a one-on-one -on -one experience. They're having an experience watching Ray in a homeless camp and then get arrested and then go to the VA and have housing, but the phone is ringing and his phone is in a dumpster, right? That's a one-on-one -on -one experience. And I think it creates uh, opportunity for people to be more open to have change. Yeah, it's the, the idea of not preaching to the choir. You know, how do we reach those people outside our circles? And the only way to do that is to try new things. You know, yep. Mark has on the animation, has on other, you know, things that we're trying to just get to the people who will help us in this plight, but who are not naturally drawn to this kind of subject. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions. Anybody other have a question for Luciana? Anybody else? Um, if there's not a lot of questions... What would you like to say, Luciana? I'm sorry. I, I, you, the part of the reason that you're last is because you're a friend and your family. And, you know, I just got done interviewing a bunch of people and you can just take the show yourself. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, this means so much to me. Obviously, as you guys know, I spend all this time working on these projects. Sometimes it takes months of interviewing formerly homeless people, currently homeless people, depending on the subject. I think the veterans issue is such a huge issue um, in America. I mean, obviously, we are living through some troubled times. And the question is, is what happens to these people who fight for us, with us when they come home? When do they come home? Do they have a home to come to? And what are the services that we have? A lot of the people on the chat were mentioning, like, there are services. There are homeless services. You know, you'd be surprised, even as someone who is not homeless, when I needed the services that are available to me in the housing sector, they were not there. They did not work. And I am educated, I speak the language, I have a home, I have a Wi-Fi, and I have a phone. Yeah. You know, so these things are, it was amazing to me. And I think it really helped me understand the flaw in the system. And I feel like it was kind of a gift. I wish I didn't have to go through these experiences like everybody else. But it was a gift to understand really what was happening out on the streets and the people who are less fortunate, who did not have even Wi-Fi. I mean, we saw today our guests come in and having to have help because there's no cell phone, there's no service, there's no Wi-Fi. I mean, those are real reasons. Yeah. If you need to get a job, like first thing they ask, what's your address? Like where do you have one? Amber doesn't even have a phone. She doesn't even have a phone. But I want you to repeat that again because I think it's so important because here you're college educated, you have resources, you have a car and you needed some help. Um, and it was nearly impossible for you to navigate yes and i talked to everyone as you guys can know 
you know, notice, like I called the city, I called the state, I called the police department, I called the fire department, I called anybody, I called the, the city housing inspector. He gave me information who else I could call. I called my, my uh, you know, my area's politician. Like I went to their office, I printed a case, I did everything. And the system failed me in the way that it fails a lot of other people. I recently went to a Karen Bass town hall, every single person in there. And I can say that again, it was packed. Everybody was angry. Every single person in there had an issue with housing, had an issue with zoning, had an issue with high rents, had an issue, every single one. And unfortunately, the concern seemed more about the Olympics that are coming or the, you know, the World Cup or whatever it is that the city is going to host than it was its constituents. And I was just baffled. And it went way longer than it was supposed to, to the point that she had to sit down because she was so tired. You know, and not, honestly, it was just a bunch of deflating. Nothing got answered. And I like to go to go to these experiences because it really shows: are there things put in place that supposedly are meant to help people in difficult situations in every sector, health, housing? Sure. Does it work? I mean, do you guys? You tell me if the health insurance and the health system of this country works. You tell me if the housing system of this country works. And now I'm very questioning the judicial system of this country. You know, we're all in a place that I think media for the first time ever has allowed us to see the truth, yeah. the raw truth in real time. And for now on, we'll never be the same again. It's hard to hide. And if you're hiding, you can't do it for long. So we're starting to unveil these issues that before maybe there was this misconception of whether or not it worked or it didn't work. And uh, I'm upset, you guys. No, no, no you're great. Um, the, uh, I've traveled all over from Anchorage to Tampa. The one common denominator, I got to say there's two. The two common denominators of homelessness everywhere is one, it's horrible. I got to say three. One, it's horrible. Two, we got to get people off the streets into housing. And three, the insane amount of times people have asked for help and been turned away. There was, there's a, uh, uh, a single mom in our online support group who tells the story um, that she was going through a domestic violence situation and she counted up to 50, 50 times she reached out to help and nobody was there. There's another single mom, Carrie Fuller, uh, who you may know from Invisible People. She once called and she put it on YouTube, her asking for help. and like, you know, it was maddening. This idea that there's plenty of help. I think people are just not aware. It's something politicians often say. We'll hear it from politicians. Oh, they're service resistant. They don't want to go. So people assume that. It's also maybe for some, it's a cop out. It's it, so they don't have to do anything and care. They can just go. But the truth is, there is not enough support. And it is getting worse, not better. Yeah, I mean, here's a simple example. You know, during the pandemic, we had the unemployment and all the lines were super busy and people were spending weeks trying to get through to the system to file their unemployment. And I remember calling as well some of the politicians in my area to try to figure it out, like how, what are you doing to solve this problem when people in California can't file for their unemployment? And after calling them every day, I finally got somebody who responded and said, oh, I don't know if there's an issue because I didn't have to file, to file an unemployment case. Wow. Oh, so because we pay our taxes and you have a job, you don't know how to help your constituents. Like, so then can I opt out of paying these taxes because you're not doing your job, yeah. you know? And that really made me mad. And I'm like, well, how come there was no one trying? There was no one testing the system. There's no going through it just to see what's happening and how can you help the people that you're supposed to be helping? And that to me just blew my mind. So that, that's exactly what happens in every every sector of the housing yeah. world in America. Yeah. Um, it, it reminds me of the, the Grants Pass documentary we put up, that one of the lines, the woman says that, you know, the, um, the cop asked him, why do you have a salt and pepper shaker? And they, because they season their food. And he's like, well, I have it because I have a house. And I can literally envision somebody saying that to a homeless person. Right. I really can. But anyways, Sarah has 
Well, it's not really a question. She made another statement. It said, it would be great for people to host film showings in their local communities, invite other people who might want to advocate for change. It would. One of the things we did our last for eviction, we actually did this, what we're doing today, live in a theater and online. We did a hybrid uh, because I think both have value. Um, and it was more of a prototype to make sure that we could pull it off. There was little hiccups in the live part. <laughs> um, but, you know, we did this on stage and Sarah Diane Yentl came in and it was about uh, eviction and affordable housing. So the, the vision for next steps was we would have these film premieres around the country in theaters, as many as we could afford, but also have local panels at the same time. So there is value to the local panel. I'm not saying there isn't. There's, you know, I find that if you can get people like online, you can reach a lot of people. We reach 2,000 people every minute. Mm -hmm. and online, you can reach a lot of people. If you can take them and get them in an event, then you have a better chance because you have this interactive conversation. The thing is, when you go through that funnel, the people that will go to events are normally people that already care for homelessness. That's an important demographic because those are people that are the army. We can, you know, equip them to start taking action. So to your point, those are things we want to do, but we need some resources to make them happen. But yes, all the above. Um, and hopefully someday we will. Is there any other question? And Sarah, thank you for joining us and thank you for um, uh, all the wonderful questions and statements. Anybody else? Anything you would like to say, Luciana? I mean, this is your film. Yeah, I mean, I, the fight goes on. You know, this is just one case. We talk a lot about what other movies can we make. I think it's important to champion all the people in this sector, you know, the nonprofit sector, uh, the social work sector. There is burnout in this sector more than any other. But there are such wonderful people fighting for the right things and trying to improve the lives of others. Um, it's admirable, you know, admirable. And we talk about making a movie one day called Exhausted in honor of those people and telling the story of the people in the, you know, the social work sector. And I'm always so humbled by them because it takes so much effort and it's a lifelong process. Yeah. You know, this is, these are not easy to solve problems. We did a, we did a VR film with Meta Facebook. And one of the things that I was pushing for, and, you know, back a little bit, I gave Luciana credit for the veteran because that was her part. Me, it was the criminalization, right? We're both, it's got to be criminalization, got to be a veteran, got to be criminalization. And we came together, you know, kind of like uh, uh, peanut butter and chocolate, right? You know. Uh, <laughs> jelly, Mark, jelly. Yeah, I'm getting tired. I'm getting, I'm getting stupid. <laughs> but, um, uh, I've always wanted to tell the story from the lens of a case manager for a couple of reasons is one, the public doesn't really like, you know, people are saying in the chat, Oh, everybody has support. And there's this belief, false belief that people are service resistant. And I believe if we could tell the story from a case manager, people would see the amount of bureaucracy that, case managers face trying to get somebody help. We can also talk about how many of them can't even afford, they're not paid enough to, to, to live in the cities that they're trying to help people. Just like teachers, you know, again, I was a teacher for a while and it's a same similar case. Like they are put so much to really form, change, create these massive social changes. And yet they're underpaid I mean, them themselves are trying to like m improve yeah. their lives and, you know, even some guys just support their kids and they can't um, have childcare so they can work longer hours. I mean, all these things are challenges that, I'll, you know, everyone faces. So, you know, I, I also understand 
the people who think that there is a system out there that's supposed to work for them because I was one of those people. I felt, I thought, well, I pay my taxes. There are services. Look, there's a number online you can call and then you try to call the number and then you try yeah. to call again and then you call again and then you send them evidence and then it's still nothing happens. And you're like, what? What do you mean? Like, you can, yeah. look, here's the video, here's the photo, here's the this, this is that, it's still nothing. So it, it's, you know, it's really just a big smoke mirror. We have 430 people watching right now. Most of them on Twitter, which is amazing. And Sean is stuck with us. Sean is still in the green room. Um, if you guys want, I mean, I, I originally scheduled that we would be done by now. Uh, but if you want, um, I can bring Sean back up if Sean's willing. Sean, nod, nod your head. Yeah, he's <laughs> willing. So let me bring Sean back up. It'll be the three of us. I think we can do this. Yeah. We are. <laughs> yeah, there we are. So, oh. Sean, you've been very patiently waiting. Um, and so um, what do you think about what we've been talking about? Um, well, I, I, I think one of the things we really need to do is get, get people mobilized and, and, and excited to make change. Um, because even right here in California, we have SB 1011, which is a bill to criminalize homelessness that is, you know, uh, going going through the uh, state right now. And and um, I hear it was shot down. I hear it was shot down oh, yesterday. Excellent. And, and I have not confirmed, although it came from the law center, that they played the New York Times video and it helped in some way. Yeah, yeah. And and this this current climate of of politics, um, yeah. Uh, People aren't first, and people need to be put first in in, in everything that we do. And uh, you know, we we've lost sight of that. And it, and it takes people like us and others and you and everyone to to go out there and try to remind people we we need to we need to bring back humanity. You know, it's about taking care of people. Yes, you know, very much so. Simple. Very much so. Yeah. And and, and I the love, challenge. Go ahead. I, well, I love some of the things you were saying because I tell people it was just something as simple as saying hello to someone. Someone people always say, Well, what, what can I do to help? You know, I, I you know, I, I don't really want to get involved, it's kind of scary. When we're, like, it doesn't take anything difficult. You could just say hello, you know, and start with that. Um, because yeah, I, I living on the street, I never felt more isolated and alone than I did in my life, even though there were people everywhere all around me, but none of them would look at me, none of them would respond to me. I would say, you know, uh, you know, good morning or good afternoon to someone, and they just you get silence and they look away. Um, I would have preferred you told me to. I I, I don't want to. To oh, well, you can, you can. I, I would have preferred you told me to fuck off because then at least I would have had known that you saw me, you heard me, and and interacted. Um, because it, it's just it's just awful that we can try to ignore people. Um, you know, and 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 it's it's the most cruel thing. And like I said, something as simple as just saying hello made such a difference in my day and the way I felt, and it just lifts lifts you up. And, and like I said, start from there. Um, if you offer help to someone and they don't necessarily take it, whatever, guess what? It's not personal. It's not the end of the day. Um, you walked into their life already in progress. Um, you have the advantage of having doors and walls around you. So you, someone can knock and you can decide whether or not to answer it. When someone's homeless, people just walk up to you and just assume that you're waiting for them all day to bring you that water or whatever it was. And, and I may have just had something going on in my family or, or just in my personal head or, or, or well, the mental health. Came in the workforce. Somebody might have got a flat tire, got an argument with their partner. And and you're walking into my life already in motion. And, and I appreciate you, but sometimes not everyone's ready to receive you. And it's nothing personal. Try again tomorrow. And you know? I, I just put a, we have an animation about giving eye contact. Um, Rob, I, I gotta, Rob just said something and, and Rob, I, I'm going to talk to you directly, although there might be others. And, uh, those of you in the invisible people family pray for me. Cause I often go on and rant like this. Um, Rod said housing first, sobriety first. Well, here's the thing, right? Mm, I'm going to be nice. Um, people use drugs to escape pain that part homelessness sucks right um if you're going to a bathroom behind a mcdonald's dumpster uh you might as well have a beer and i'm not advocating for alcoholism i'm just saying let's put it in some perspective well, right well, well, and well, and treatment right drug treatment 
fails more than it works. Yeah. It fails more than it works. Treatment mm -hmm. plus housing has the best outcomes. Housing plus treatment works. It is what's needed. Um, uh, I'm going to be nice. I'm going to be nice. I couldn't even begin to address my addiction issues until I had a roof over my head and, and, and a constant place to be that doesn't change day to day. And um, yeah, and just, just the mental anguish of, of the failure of being homeless is enough. And I don't have, you know, I didn't have Prozac to take. I didn't have TV to watch. I didn't have the newspaper. I didn't have a book to read. Um, all the outlets and things. I didn't have people, a social network to talk to that's going to, that's willing to listen. All a, a therapist, all the things that you have access to, I did not have. And are all uh, were in my journey, a very necessary part of me being able to be four and a half years clean, you know, since being off the street, because there, there's no way I could begin to even address my medical issues, my high blood pressure, my glaucoma, um, all the other things. That help me. Um, um, you know, I had eye surgeries. You can't have that on the street and then have to be in a, in a, in a you know, maintain a, a, a clinical environment. And how do you do that? You know, with, with a patch over your eye and you're on the street, you can't do it. So therefore, Sean ends up just losing the vision because we can't have the surgery. Um, you need housing. You do need housing first to make all these things possible. And, and I'm a living example of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One, of, one of the things that people don't realize is insurance only pays for 28 days. Yeah. So if a person goes, well, it's all, so let's say somebody wants to go into detox to get sober. They go into detox for three days. They get out. There's no treatment. Oh, so then they're back outside and they drink and use again. Or if they're lucky, they get oh. into treatment. And that's only 28 days. And then they're exited back to homeless. Right. And then they drink and use again. Treatment, we need, treatment's important. We need to fix treatment. We need better treatment. But without housing, treatment often fails. I mean, with housing, it fails too, because you don't understand. Like, I was a drug addict for many, many years. And it's not a switch that you can turn on and off. Yeah. Jenny, to say, like, this is my problem is that people seem to hold the homeless to a higher standard, okay? Oh, you're homeless, you can't drink. You're homeless, you can't, you're homeless. I challenge our audience to go, to think about their own habits and see where are they addicted to what. Like, Sean, that's a great point. Some people go home and watch television for 10 hours. Like, that's an addiction. I'm sorry. If you're, like, checking out of your life for however, how many hours that is, some people go home and eat a whole, you know, entire pizza. Well, I'm sorry. You're numbing yourself in some other way. Some people, I know a lot of successful people who are drunks. And they're successful, so nobody confronts them. And and remember, uh, the homeless has this other like higher standard you have to you know withhold. And and remember, for someone who's homeless, um, there is no place you can legally have a drink because you're in right. public, and uh, that's often used right. against us. Um, when uh, on one occasion uh, we survived a sweep and actually made it out with our most of our belongings, and one of the neighbors came came by and he's like, oh, you know, we need to celebrate this, so. He went and bought uh, a couple of six packs, brought them over, and we all like cracked a beer and we're, you know, having a toast, whatever. He then went and went to the corner, got on his phone and called the police and said they're drinking in public. <gasps> and the police came and wrote us all citations yeah. um, because we, no matter even if you're in your tent, you're in public. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Um, but, you know, yeah, the pe people can be really, really mean spirited. Well, Rob, you said you got sober and that's great. And you got sober in treatment. That's great. A lot of people do the thinking that anybody can do it, you know, uh, like, uh, bolt the fastest man ran the, the hundred meters in anybody under 10 seconds. Anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. Right. You know, the thinking, you know, this one of the things, and I don't mean to be just picking on you, Rob, it's, you brought up the conversation is that when somebody gets sober or they get off the streets and it's a very small population, but then they also, they start judging others and saying, Oh, they can do it. They can do it. You know, or I got sober in jail. Everybody should get arrested. What the. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's and, hypocrisy, right? You know, Ryan every, Supreme. Yeah. Everyone is different. Everyone's unique and has their own set of issues and things that have happened in their life. And none of us have walked in their shoes. Yeah. So it went. And and Rob, last, last thing you said, you get a better chance of having a home than a sober citizen. Yes. West yeah. Virginia. 
<laughs> as the highest per capita drug use of any state in America. And they have low homelessness. Why? Because they have affordable housing. Most heroin users drink. I mean, most heroin users will never experience homelessness in their lifetime. They're using behind walls so you don't see them. The thinking that uh, we're going to move on from this, but the point is that heroin, I was a heroin addict. Heroin is the perfect drug to escape because homelessness was horrible. I can't even explain the helplessness you feel while homeless. And I want to escape heroin. Boom. You know, um, yeah, got to move on. Today was a great day. It was. And thank you all for being here. It means so much to us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we're going to close it out. We got a couple of minutes. Does anybody have a question for Luciana or Sean? And as Sarah just said, it's easier to blame people for their homelessness than to help them. Ooh, that should be a t-shirt. Right. <laughs> yeah. I also think, you know, as we close as last thoughts, you know, it's like, how do we engage people in a conversation about an issue before it touches them, right? Before they are hurt by it, before wow. they see themselves in that situation. That's the challenge. How can we find avenues to engage all of us as equals that we are before any of us is in need? in whatever scenario it is. But in this case, like Sean said, is like, unless you go through it, unless you experience some part of it, you just don't understand it. So how can we help with, help with the understanding part is why we're here today. Yep. I am adding some final links. Yeah. Sean, you wanna give some final thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I think we need to think about solutions. We need to think about how we can solve these things together instead of pointing the finger, judging and trying to criminalize our way out of it. Um, that's just not the way to do it. You know, where society society exists so that we can so that we can take care of all who are in the society, the strong ones and the weak ones. And everyone may be at some point in their Oh no, we lost him. Oh he cut out. Uh Sean, I'm sorry. You cut out. Don't know how that happened. Well it looks like me and you <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you, Luciana. I am going to close it out. You've been wonderful. And thank you for making this amazing movie. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for allowing me to make this amazing movie with you. It's, you know, you're an expert for many reasons, for listening to stories, for, you know, giving people the space to speak up for their stories. And, you know, I feel honored to be a little part of it. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I added some links. So they are to the Grants Pass uh, video, to the New York Times video. You guys, uh, down below, there's links to Displaced, uh, Invisible People Family. Please, we need you guys to start sharing this stuff out. And, um, oh, All For War. Interesting name. What'd you think? How'd you like the new movie? Um, and I put in the link to the Johnson v. Grants Pass .com. Uh, I, I I'm linking to the page where there's advocacy actions around the country. Maybe there's one close to you. Maybe you want to do one on your own. Maybe you just want to go to the website and learn. This is an important conversation. Those of you that hung out today and those of you um, that participated in the live stream as guests or just hanging out in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Addie. Addie is the best. I will argue she is the best chat moderator. We just got to get her off the couch into a home. And I will end with a little something. And there's Dan. When's the next live? That's Dan. Dan is in the UK. Um, Give a little bit of history here. I used to go live every Sunday night for a couple of years. Um, and I moved to LA and the time zone just didn't work. So I've only gone live occasionally. But 
I went live last Sunday and we're live today because I'm, I'm doing, why am I doing this? I don't know. <laughs> I'm tired. It takes a lot of energy hosting this. Um, but I can't this Sunday. Uh, we're off in to Washington, D.C. to the protest. If you're in Washington, D.C., come say hello. Um, but I will promise, I will promise, and I always keep my word, we're going to come back live. We're going to come back. I'll figure out how to take a day off somehow. Maybe I'll be a Monday or something. I don't know. Uh, but you guys want to um, hang out and uh, you are the best. So we're going to come back live. Thank you, everybody. It has been a great day being able to talk to you, educate, and share some experiences and um i hope you like all the the video i normally we don't post everything like you know we did the documentary last night and displaced today and the youtube algorithms don't like it so close but you guys are all going to share it right you're going to share it share it share it and then the algorithms will go hey and those of you on twitter hello we'll start live streaming more to twitter that's awesome Everybody, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, you made my day.